later those you love will do the same for you. And you may have thought it's tragic, not to mention other adjectives, to think of all the weeping they will do. But don't you worry, no more ashes, no more sackcloth, and an armband made of black cloth will someday never more adorn a sleeve. For if the bomb that drops on you gets your friends and neighbors too, there'll be nobody left behind to grieve. And we will all go together when we go. What a comforting fact that is to know. Universal bereavement and inspiring achievement. Yes, we all will go together when we go. With an incandescent glow No one will have the endurance To collect on his Mitch, I can't hear a thing. Awake. We will all charge together when we charge. And let there be no moaning of the bar. Just sing out a TDM when you see that I see the M and the party will be come as you are. Well, the party will indeed be come as you are. I'm very pleased today to have as my special featured guest, a longtime friend and research colleague from Toronto, Canada, Claire Coon by name. We first became acquainted in relation to an issue we featured recently with Tina Turner. Did Paul McCartney die and was he replaced around 1966? There was so much interest generated by Tina's appearance I thought it would be great to have Claire come on with her divergent point of view, though they overlap in many respects. Claire, it's great to have you here on the Rod Deal. Thank you, Jim. I think you met Tina Foster, not Tina Turner. You know? <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. Yes, yes, yes. Another. And do I still great. have a bar over my face as uh, before? It's gone. It's gone. Go right ahead, Claire. Okay, good. <laughs> Well, um, nice to see you again, Jim, for this uh, casual conversation. Yes, why don't you tell everyone how you became interested in uh, in the Paul issue from the beginning? Okay, well, um, you know, as a lot of people had who were born in the 70s, um, I heard that there was, you know, maybe a record that said Paul is dead um, backwards. I heard of, like, the idea of satanic reversals and I thought it was woo woo nonsense and I um I'd heard that people had supposedly smoked up in college basements in the sixties and I thought it was silly. To be honest, I but 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 I always had a major sense something was wrong with Paul. Meaning something's wrong with the historical figure we call Paul. I wouldn't have of course have posited it was two people in one image or or historical reality and um until i did work with you on kennedy and other issues which probably would be better not to go into except kennedy for new people who are coming into these subjects so it's good to have one subject at a time but uh those things gave me a background just how normal these things are now and my historical background through the medieval the roman the Egyptian, the early modern periods, the stuff that I studied all my life meant that I knew it had always gone on. So all I had to do was connect now to then and here to there. And it was like, well, it was quite possible. And then, of course, I heard more and more and more about this. And I thought, well, I'll do a symbolic analysis of the so-called album clues and as I've said on other interviews, as I looked into them, I realized the 
Paul is dead believers were being misrepresented. So I thought I would write about how they got it wrong, but they were being misrepresented. They weren't saying you can see stars and stripes or bars and lines anywhere. They were talking about very specific images and um, mostly uh, really easy to see. And they were all about Paul dying. So I, I started in that way and very quickly I realized that uh, the green eyes that were shown for what we can call Sir Paul now, the replacement, his name is Bill, he showed his green eyes very clearly once in 1967. Um, other indications physically and emotionally that I had always noticed this was the explanation for it. So as I said, I went from that silly, but okay, some people are weird, to all right, they're being misrepresented, to okay, this is very, very solid. And of course, when you talk about green eyes, you mean by contrast with James Paul McCartney, who had brown eyes, whereas yes. his, the person we could refer to as Paul, commonly for false Paul or fake Paul, has green eyes, but they have quite a few other physical dissimilarities. Did you want to inventory them? Well, um, I mean, I can do that. Um, you know, it's basically what, what people need to realize if they're doing this sort of work is that um, there are a lot of mistakes made by people who aren't familiar with photographic issues, optics, and so on. You need, you need to at least familiarize yourself after you start if you're not familiar before. Um, and there are a lot of body movement differences that, I mean, Jim, sometimes you act maybe exactly the same as I do, but it will be a split second. It's not going to be consistently in the same emotions. You're going to do the same things. So there are basically everything is different about the two men. They are two men, but um, there are similarities. So, so for instance, as one head turns, I'll just give people a conceptual basis. Certain things will seem similar, and certain things will be a bit dissimilar, but you could say, well, maybe they're the same person in some photographs. Then they turn the head, and again, different things will be similar, and different things will be different. Okay, so each time you take a, a picture that is um, the same angle, uh, most of the time, they're going to look fairly similar in those angles, and people think that proves it's the same person. But in fact, if you compare what Paul himself would have looked like in one angle to what you would expect in another angle, he matches himself. And if you take Paul, or I prefer to call him Sir Paul or Bill, and you look at him in an angle and you turn him in an angle, he looks like himself. The two angles will match each one. But if you go from Paul to Bill in a different angle, you will really notice the differences because Paul wouldn't have changed that way. So points A, B, and C might be similar in the first example, but points D, E, and F will be similar in the second example, and A, B, C will be off. Well, so that's, that's a conceptual um, idea. So the ears are different, the eyes are different, the skin is different, the hair is different, the way it grows, the way how he's tall. But there are mistakes in some of the evidence that people purport is evidence of the replacement. Not everyone does it very well. Well, I think you had been insisting to me that Paul had been replaced for at least a year and a half, possibly two years, when I encountered the Italian forensic scientist review of the evidence where they set out to prove they were the same and found yes. precisely the opposite. It turned out they had different teeth and different palates, that Paul had bad teeth and a narrow palate, that Paul or Bill had good teeth and a normal palate, that uh, uh, Paul had a round face and a very youthful look, whereas Bill has an oval face and a definitely more adult or mature look. We have photographs with the two of them with Jane Asher, to whom Paul was engaged, and they were approximately the same height. But when Bill is photographed with Jane Asher, he's about four inches taller. And as you have observed, uh, the Beatles, the original Beatles, were all roughly the same height. Ringo perhaps slightly shorter, 
but the other is almost the same height. And yet now when you throw Bill into the mix, he's decidedly taller than the others. Would you agree with all of those? Uh, yeah, I do. It, regarding the height, see, I did art as well as history. And one of the things you learn if you do art properly is you learn about perspective issues and cameras. And um, Bill cannot be more than about two to three t inches taller than John and Paul. But it's enough to show up in certain conditions decidedly. It's just enough. But in some photos, he'll look even taller, and in some photos, he will approximate Paul almost. So what happens is his range in the perspective will be higher up. So he'll sort of start where Paul is and move up, uh, whereas Paul would go from below Paul to just above Paul because of the way uh, perspective works. So some people have made Bill too large. Uh, some of them have made Paul too small, but Paul was probably about 5'9 at the most. Uh, they probably lied to say that John and Paul were taller and said 5'11. There's quite a bit of evidence for that, and I can't go into it, and it's not only photographs. It's also people who tried on the Sergeant Pepper costume that John wore, and they were six feet, and, and it's fitting too small and short. It's by about an inch. So, they're, sorry, it, so they're five eleven, and it fits too small for them, too short for them. So Bill has to be about you know two to three inches, and and people think that's a lot when they meet a person because they have to look up. But in a camera, it's not that much. You know, I can sort of show it's like about like this. So if the distortion happens, it's going to be in a range up here, whereas Paul would have a distortion like about down here. If that if that makes sense. The other thing that um, you did nicely was summarize some of the more overt points of comparison that the that the um, that the forensic scientists had. But actually, in my very first broadcast with you in 2012, though you didn't remember it, um, I brought up all of that. I think it took you a while to come back to that and rediscover it because it was all audio. But uh, I had told you about it maybe about uh, 2010 and a half. And uh, Jack White and I e emailed you, and then by by February or no January 2012, we did our first broadcast on the issue, and I did mention everything like that. I was already aware of it. But yes, I'm glad that you have conceived those things, and you interviewed Tina Foster, and she makes the point that with only I think it is I forget whether it's 15 or 20 points of difference between two people is considered a different person and the the um the, the forensic scientists found something like i don't know it was 30 uh, but you know i mean they, they just sort of stopped i mean it's like well they're different people well sure i mean from the point of view of logic i mean two things are the same thing if and only if they have all and only the same properties <laughs> Exactly. When, we, when you're talking about things that can change properties across time, like you could gain weight or lose it, it turns right. out that you must have all and only the same properties at the same times. But here right. we're talking about relatively non-changeable features such as one's height once you reach your maturity. And there's a constant difference, which you've described roughly in terms of uh, variations and measurement so that Yes. By measure theory, we're talking about an average of different measurements, and there's no question that but that Fall or Bill, since he appears to be William Shepard or Billy Shears, as he was introduced in the Sergeant Pepper album, is indeed uh, several inches taller than uh, yes. uh, James Paul McCartney. Ta why don't you talk about the cover? Because I thought Sergeant Pepper was really trying to tell us everything that we have sought after for all those years after, including when he was introduced as the one and only Billy Shears. Yeah, okay. Um, well, see, the rumor that was famous, I guess we should talk about first, which is 1969 in the fall. Um, it was leaked... There's, I'm, I'm going to summarize the current findings as I consider them so that I'm not going into all of the evidence for each one. So I'll just give people the story, okay? Uh, in the fall of 1969, officially, 
um, there was a rumor in the USA among college students that was presented. Um, and yet, there seems to have been a leak. And in fact, there was a rumor years before. Uh, the first time it was printed was in 1967 in February, Beatles book, which was printed only in 19, in the UK. Uh, and before that, we have several testimonies that the rumor actually started earlier in the fall of 66. One person superficially recanted, but it's very obvious he wasn't really recanting. Um, another person uh, wrote it in his book. He's now dead, and he talked about it. He's hinting at it. Uh, but anyway, the rumor officially starts in most of the pieces you'll read. It starts in the, the fall of 1969 in the USA, and it's treated as a bunch of crazy college students contacting DJs and writing weird papers in their uh, college um, um, newspapers, and then, oh, it took off, and everybody was crazy. It was the end of the 60s, and then it petered out when everyone realized that Paul was still alive. That's the official story. Uh, the real story is that, as I said, the rumor had, in fact, been in print two years, uh, well, two and a half years earlier, about a half year after Paul died. Uh, there was a news broadcast the day it happened, okay, uh, during a show which shows premeditation in the topic of the show, um, which we can get to, um, but I won't talk about the murder as a solid thing because I think it's very important that we leave it open. So if there ever were a, a leak that this had happened, the official people could say it was an accident. Okay. Well, my own... Um, yeah, my own uh... Research led me to the conclusion that it had been an accident, that there'd been an argument in the studio, that ironically it was on 9-11-1966, that it was raining yeah. heavily, that Paul drove off, picked up by a woman who was standing in the rain, that she was so excited to see him, she got overly excited and hugged him and caused him to run a stop sign and be hit by a van, that he was pinned in the vehicle, she got out, the the car caught fire, and he burned to death. That has been my take on the story. You're welcome now to say what your research has led you to conclude, because you, like Tina and Nick Kohlerstrom, who, among the three of you, I think, have done the most work on this whole issue, go ahead and offer what your take would be in contrast to mine. Okay, well, I know that you keep repeating that, and of course, I'm not saying this in any unfriendly way, but that was, as Tina said, the made-up story by Fred Labour in late 1969, and he talked about how he made it up from, you know, he had certain things from other students that he heard, okay? Uh, but he also went through album covers and kind of said, well... I'm going to make it into a story. And so he assumed that Paul would be in the studio. And because Ringo sang, you were in a car crash and you lost your hair, will you please come back? Um, he took that and he made a story as though Paul was in the studio. Paul was not in a studio. They were not recording. Uh, there was no records of recording at the time. Nobody was in the studio. And well, how, about the date? Girl... how about the date, Claire? Was it 9-11-1966 or another date? Was it in London? Tina actually suggested he might have died in Seattle, which I found rather stunning, but there it is. Yeah. Well, we can get to those things in time, but just in terms of the basic narrative thing, Fred Labour made that up. Now, the very first person who wrote about it was Tim Harper, and he wrote about it in a newspaper called The the, the Delphic, which means the Delphic Oracle or newspaper that's going to tell you important information. It was a student newspaper, and it was on September 17, 1969. Fred Labour doesn't come in until about a month or a month and a half later with his fancy story of how it happened. So just to take away the version that you said, okay, which is what that's from, um, and to get to the date, the date is a very fine argument, okay? And I went over it in the last couple of broadcasts that I did with some other people. It takes a little time, if you can bear with me, people. Um, there is a so-called clue on Sgt. Pepper album cover uh, that if you mirror some letters 
in the drum skin uh, in the center, they become IIIX or 111X, however you like to read it, uh, then he died. Okay? So uh, what happened was in November 1969 on a radio show where uh, George Harrison seems to have called in as well, it was leaked that there was a clue there. I don't think that anyone actually thought it thought that up themselves. It's too buried. Most people wouldn't think that up. So so basically um, it was leaked, but they gave the idea of November uh, November 9th, which in the USA would be 11-9, uh, right? And that would be the number in the USA. So they leaked this with a certain amount of disinformation in my belief, but they leaked that there was a clue there. Then if you notice in the UK, 11-9 would be 9-11. They would, they would treat November 9th as 9 day and 11th month. So what, what you would actually have in the UK is 9-11 would be the way that you would um, say September 11th. Okay, so I mean, sorry, 11-9 um, would be the way that you would say September 11th because it would be day month. So in the last few years, including me, a lot of people have flipped those and said, well, instead of November 9th, it was really September 11th. So 111X becomes 11 Arabic numerals for 11 and IX, which is Roman numeral 9. So you go from Arabic to Roman and you divide up the 111X in the 111X he died. You divide it up and you go from Arabic to Roman. And then you interpret it in a USA way and then you interpret it in a UK way. I think that's wrong. And the reason I do is that 111X or IIIX backwards is an easy thing. It's an easy thing to conceive. It's 13 all in Roman numerals. X I I I or X one one one, and Paul McCartney, four letters and nine letters has thirteen letters. Okay, so Paul McCartney, he died, but it's backwards and all in Roman numerals. It also works for the date because the thirteenth of September was a Tuesday, and John Lennon famously said sang in his song, I Am the Walrus, in 1967, he sang, sorry, in, um, uh, in, uh, in um, yes, was it I Am the Walrus, or was it, uh, 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 yes, I Am the Walrus, he sang um, um, Stupid Bloody Tuesday, so, and, and there's other things, the, the news broadcast came out on that date, Okay, it came out in the USA on the 12th, which is the UK on the 13th. So everything focuses about the 12th or 13th midnight. Of September. And of September. Of, of September. And the 9-11-11-9 the, the confusion with November um, uh, 9th or September 11th gets you close. If you flip it, ironically, you're close from November over to September, but it has to have happened in September or before. It cannot have happened later, and there's other reasons for this. Number one, there's no Paul after that. There's nothing. He never shows up again. So it's going to be probably at the beginning of that period. It also has the news broadcast. The news broadcast was worldwide. It was carried worldwide. It was briefly on the BBC. It was in the, in the morning. It was, it was on the, because uh, they didn't run at night. It was in the USA, on the East Coast, the Central, the West Coast, and it was in Australia. It was on radio and TV. And I've gotten the legal, the legal testimony to the fact that it was on TV in the East Coast of the USA. And other people I know also have talked about those other places. Okay, so... So basically, this was an international leak, and it occurred just after midnight on September 13th, UK time, at about 12.30, 12.40 a.m., which is 7.30, 7.45 Eastern time. 
And for about two or three hours, it ran across the U.S. and it developed. It went from, you know, a, be a, a beetle has been in a serious car accident, more news at 11, kids begged to stay up. In those days, a lot of kids didn't stay up and watch TV at 11. Um, and there was no more news at 11. But now then in the West Coast, it was announced Paul McCartney has died in a car accident, more news at 11, and that never happened. So by the early hours of the morning further, it was no longer being announced. So probably leaked from England at that time. This brings us to Tina. Tina has written an awesome book. It is a really good book. It goes through all kinds of evidence out there. Um, there are things that some people won't like about it, uh, spiritual kinds of arguments that this must have happened. I'm okay with those arguments. Some people are not. But the, the, the factual arguments are very strong in it. No one can be perfect. No one can cover everything. The difficulty that I have with her is the date of death, um, primarily, because she took... Um, an influence uh, early on that might have happened in Seattle, and she interprets um, a yellow submarine um, a fixing a hole song, and what is the other one? Um, uh, uh, Octopus's Garden. She interprets that as a burial at sea, so that's part of her argument. Now he might have been buried at sea, but she takes the idea that Seattle was the place from something else, and I won't mention it right now, but she, she takes it from that. And uh, the, the problem with that for me is that all other evidence points to September, including a news leak that was worldwide. And she also starts to say that Paul, in the late news broadcast at the end of August, uh, 1966, when they were still in the USA, are not Paul. So she says he's the best double ever. So does a man named Mike Williams, who's gotten some prominence promoting a book about this, The Memoirs of Billy Shears. Um, and he says, oh, that's not Paul, but boy, he looks like Paul. It's Paul. Uh, Paul is there until the end of the concert. He gets back to London. We have footage of him going into London. Um, and then he disappears. He disappears. Uh, there is one thing that he did, which is the Melody Maker Awards, and I think they lied about the date of that, putting it back a few days to when it probably occurred, and Paul was dead by the 13th, and they later claimed on September 17th, 1966, the Melody Maker Awards uh, magazine claimed they'd had an award on the 13th, which is the, which is the Tuesday, and I think that was to keep him alive on the day he died. So that it, it, it kind of like if anybody heard he died, it's like, no, he was at the Melody Makers. It's an early cover-up cover attempt. Three years later, that's the exact date that the first leak was published in the USA for Tim Harper. It was September 17th, 1969. So I think that, that, that that's the cover-up date and the reveal date. So, so I believe he died on the, tur the midnight, turn of midnight, September 12th to 13th. From the drumskin argument, revisited. From the news broadcast, revisited. From the, um, from the fact that I recognized Paul right up to that point. And from the melody makers being on that date, but not on that date. That's, so those are the main arguments to say he died in early September. And after that, there's chaos. That's another argument, is that he was gone then. And that, that after that, they had to scramble. I think those are good arguments, Claire. Do you believe then he was he died in the UK, as would be my inference, or else? I do, I do. I believe he died in Liverpool, and there's several arguments for that. Um, the fact is that he had. If, if Stephen Dickinson is right, we can talk about that in a minute. I know Tina is not as familiar with the Stephen Dickinson argument, and so. But anyway, if his mother wasn't lying, and if he was a 10 month from sex to birth baby, which I was, I was a 10 month baby, but, but it isn't 10 months in the womb, it's 10 months all told, I was a little over the average, and the average is nine, over nine and a half months, people don't realize that, they think nine months it isn't. 
So, so a 10-month baby from sex, if the person dies or you go on a holiday and you know exactly when the last sex was you had, is not actually that uncommon when you, you're not inducing a baby. So, and many women won't know exactly which sex, like in the week it was that got them pregnant. So basically a 10 months is slightly over the average, which helps make the average. So let's say Stephen Dickinson wasn't lying, and let's say his mother was there. Irene lived in Liverpool. She lived right by a location that is Abbey Road, Liverpool. It's a tiny little street. And on Google Earth to this day, although they may take it down after this broadcast, um, for one click on Google Earth, the camera changes, the day changes, the buildings are not being renovated. Now they're all renovated, and it says Altered Images Salon. There's a magical mystery bus, which is a kind of a tour bus thing. Um, and it's a totally different day on the Google search for one click from Abbey Road over to the next street right there in Liverpool, and then you're back into a great day of the rest of the car, when the car went by for, for Google. It's also right by a triangle park, like a little triangle park, which you will recognize from the Dealey Plaza connection. So if there was a murder, and I always say if, but if there was, that would have been the perfect location, and it was right down the street from where Irene was living, which is Stephen's um, uh, mother and this idea of a woman being present, not a fan, not a prostitute, as is later presented, could have been Irene. He could have gone up after the uh, the um, Melody Maker Awards on the 10th or 11th, been up in Liverpool on the 12th, crossed over the bridge. Some people suggest that there were explosions in the car. It may also have been that he was stopped and met, he met somebody and he was pulled out and shot or he could have been walking across the street and just been hit as the the, the being hit you know uh, from walking across the street that's very common in the imagery including Abbey Road um, album and so on I think it was Liverpool I think Irene was there I think it was right after the Melody Maker Awards really occurred I think it was on the midnight 12th to 13th, and within a half hour, it got out on the wires, and it was not a leak that was deliberate. I think the, there, there was an intentional leak. I, I won't go into that on this broadcast, but this one, I think, was the mistake. Uh, and then after that, there's chaos. And two years later, on the 17th, when the Melody Maker Awards lied on that Saturday, two years after that, out comes Tim Harper at the Oracle, I think, with a leak. So what you have is, you know, uh, I, I think it happened in Liverpool. I think that if it was a dirty deed, it was done at an Abbey Road in Liverpool to freak the Beatles out. Uh, it was very close to Irene. It's near the Dealey Plaza-like mm -hmm. little triangle park that's there, just down there. Google Images shows it there. They show a change in the, for one click, you're in a different car on a different day with beautiful sunlight and altered images salon and a magical mystery box in the picture on Google Earth Street View. Do we know how, so I, I, go ahead, do we know how Irene and Paul linked up? Well, all we know is what Stephen was told or surmised, so I guess we should tell the audience who he is. He's a Liverpool man in his 50s who was told when he turned seven, uh, he was told by his mother, who was a fairly reserved woman and had had another child with his uh, supposed father, whom he remained friendly with to the end of his days, um, he was told at age seven by his mom, Stephen, your father was Paul McCartney, and I want you to know that. You should know that. She mentioned it several times over the subsequent seven or eight months. She would bring him aside. She supposedly showed him a photograph of herself taken in Vienna. She wasn't a traveler. And she said, Paul took this. But Stephen didn't have any physical evidence of these, these events. And then one day, she was in... Uh, he was listening to some of these Paul is Dead clues, and it was 1975, and something came on the radio. And he said, oh, my God, he's dead, because he kind of got the sense of the clues. 
And his father, it turns out his adoptive father, right? His father ran into the room and said, who's dead, son? And he said, Paul McCartney. And his mother was silent, his father was silent, but his mom later took him aside and said, yes, Stephen, your father died. I want you to know that. Mm -hmm. So basically, the most important thing about Stephen's testimony even if he isn't the son and his mother was confused and she, it wasn't actually, I mean, she had sex with someone else as well, is that if she knew Paul and she knew that he had died, she confirmed it. That's the most important thing. Later, it seems that they showed up one day with Bill, the replacement, and that, that's a whole aspect to the story. But the, even that is not necessary. If the mother confirmed that he died and she knew, I think she was there in Liverpool. I think she was traumatized. And there's one other piece of evidence for that. It's the Liverpool Oratorio written by Bill the Replacement. In 1992, I think it came out, it was mostly composed by the, Liver, uh, the London Orchestra, the head of the London Orchestra, because Bill isn't that great a composer, honestly. And he wrote this weird idea which doesn't relate to Paul, and he called it autobiographical. So what is autobiographical in it? It has a young man who's in Liverpool. It, he's not even a musician, actually. Um, there's lots of ghosts. There's lots of um, um, uh, seeking your father out, which Paul didn't do, but Stephen did. Uh, he names him Shanty. He names his Paul character, he names it Shanty, which is, now, um, you have a, 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 a Shanty in the back, which is different, that's a, like a little, um, you know, a sort of a rough uh, shed, uh, but a Shanty is a, a, a song of, 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 of mourning or traveling on the seas. It actually means a, a singing, it's the singing. So in that sense, he's named his Paul character the singer. And... This man is looking for his father. He's in the character. He's he ends up married. So instead of himself, the woman he's married to says, "I'm pregnant." Walks outside and is hit by a car. So if it's the Irene-like character, it's sort of like Irene is hit by the car instead of Paul. And then Irene dies in hospital, which happened to, or sorry, the the woman dies in hospital. Uh, just like Irene, Stephen's mother died in hospital two weeks after Stephen was supposedly met by the Beatles. And in the Liverpool Oratorium, then everybody ends up all happy somehow in heaven. It's a very strange story, and I think that it's actually a combination of Paul, silliness, Irene, Stephen. I think it's a mix of what happened and a re reimagination. So that's well, another I, argument to say that Stephen is correct. Well, I found Stephen's story of the visit by the Beatles very compelling, particularly when he says, you'll never get away with it. And John, I guess, turns around and says, we already have. Yes, and George Harrison, when, when Stephen, as the seven-year-old, almost eight, says, was it God or was it the Blue Meanies? Now, Blue Meanies is a reference to the bad guys or the blues, the emotional blues we feel uh, in Yellow Submarine. Uh, so was it, was, it, was it fate or was it conspiracy is what he's sort of saying. And George Harrison turned around and, and said, Shh. We, we have our suspicions, he said. Now, if this is true then, of course, the Beatles are beginning to wake up to what may have happened if it was murder. They also are probably coming to visit Irene herself for some reason. Now, Tina raised issues with all of this. And I, as I said, the birth is not an issue. Conception to birth, on average, from the last period, is nine and a half, over nine and a half months. Number one, that's average. Number two, we have a lot of preemies bringing down the average. So a lot of babies are also over nine and a half months from that point. Also, the fact is that most women don't know when they had the last sex because their husband doesn't necessarily die and they don't necessarily go on a trip. So there could have been way more 
my mother's, uh, my father and mother were on a trip. Like they were separated after the sex that dated me. So my mother knew it was a 10 month baby from sex. Um, so so it, it's because Paul seems to have died on September 12th, 13th, the sex could have been the 10th, 11th. And that would be the same as like knowing for me because my parents were on different trips, whereas Paul was dead. So you, met, you mentioned could, Irene was a conservative or reserved woman, but it's, having had sex with Paul McCartney would suggest either then they knew each other for some considerable time before that happened, or that's what that's what she said. She told Stephen. If I mean, now we're saying in the testimony, this is what Stephen yeah. says. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, she told Stephen, uh, you know, that she knew Paul a long time. They met when she was working. As at a typing pool, and guess where the woman who is the supposed wife or main character woman who then has the car crash and then dies in hospital in the um, Liverpool Oratorio work? She's the head of the typing pool. So I think that Irene was the um, main love alternate woman who didn't want the limelight. In Paul's life. Now, he was, remember, he's only 24 and a half when he died, okay? And he'd been going out with Jane Asher and, of course, had been having sex and emotional relations with many girlfriends and many people just on a spur-of-the-moment basis for many years. But Jane Asher was his cool girl, and she's beautiful. But Irene was um, some years older. She was uh, 30 or so when he was 24. 23 or 22, if they met in 1965 or 64, guess what? Scylla Black, Scylla Black, the other Liverpool star, was working at the local typing pool. And it was a huge typing pool right across from, or just down the street and across from, Brian Epstein's office. Not in the same building. But across the street and just like down was the BCCI, BICC, the British Indus, British uh, British Industrial uh, International uh, Telegraph Company. Anyway, it's, it's something like that. BICC or BCC. Anyway, um, and that was huge. It was the typing pool. If Irene was the head of the typing pool and Scylla Black was working there and Scylla Black had started working with Epstein and the Beatles came over for lunch sometimes, they would have met Irene. It well, asked, no. And it's yeah. in the Liverpool Oratorio is this, who is the Paul McCartney character's wife? In this case, they're married in the story. They're effectively married. Well, it's a woman in a typing pool who announces that she's pregnant just before the car impact happens, so it happens to her. And then she dies right after, but actually that was some years later. So again, you see, the, the pieces of the story have been compressed, but uh, yes, typing pool. So, um, hmm. so Irene probably was why they were visiting that day. And, I, and people have questioned, you know, oh, you can't walk down the street. The, the, the Beatles would never have just walked down the street in the middle of the day. Like, I don't believe that. I live on a street where, honestly, nobody is generally home at 2 or 3 in the afternoon. Nobody's looking out. If they do, they mind their own business. If somebody did, they could have said, yeah, hi, uh, you know, uh, see ya. Um, you know, and, and they might have had a bodyguard down the street. It's a very tiny little street that he was on. I think it was Eddington Avenue. Um, and, um, you know, a couple of houses up, uh, and they're vis visiting Irene. They're going to go right in. But instead, they stayed. Stephen kind of stopped them, chatted with them a little, and they left. Tina's objection to this whole thing is either the birth, which is not an objection at all, actually, um, or it's the You meant the duration of the objection is to the duration of the pregnancy. Yeah, because the, the sex itself can happen, especially the slightly older woman. It tends to take a few days anyway in the in the vaginal canal, and then it you know doesn't always implant right away, and so there's a whole week lost there. And if she's had a trauma, like she's seen Paul die in Liverpool, or she was with him, or whatever, um, then you know that can also increase the, the 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 if it does implant, it can take an extra few days longer. Well, that's 
all that he is longer than the average is about two, two and a half weeks. Claire, it's question, not, a, mm -hmm. a question and then a comment. The question, are you good for taking calls during the second hour? Well, I mean, we can. I, I find that that can be quite interruptive, Jim, and I'd rather have your questions, but if you really want to, I can. <laughs> Well, in case we have someone who's just dying to raise a question about this, the number for callers will be 540-352-4452. I repeat, 540-352-4452. And my comment, Claire, is the following. Uh, if Stephen is indeed Paul's illegitimate offspring. He, he is not Paul's only because we have Bettina, no. from Ger Bettina from Germany where there was a paternity test done with, alas, Fall or Bill. So of course it didn't correspond, but it would seem to me there's a potential there of comparing the paternity of Bettina with the paternity of Stephen to see if they have a common parent. Well, they're, they're, you know, again, and you, you can put it into the philosophical terminology, but just for the regular listeners, and I don't mind if you do, but the, the, for the regular listeners, um, there are some things that are physically possible if you could do them, uh, such as if I could get down a mine and grab a piece of coal and bring it back up, then I'd have a piece of coal. But the idea of getting down the mine and actually grabbing it that may actually be, be impossible. Okay, so what we have with Bettina is um, she was the only, she was a German claimant. Her mother had always been recognized as having been Paul's girlfriend during the time that Paul and John and George and Ringo were in Hamburg in the early 60s. Um, they were traveling back and forth from London to Hamburg and she was a girlfriend there for Paul. And everyone knew she was faithful to Paul, though he wasn't faithful to her. And um, and she then got pregnant, and it was recognized by the German government before he left Germany that this was Paul's child. Now, they didn't do a test at the time. They recognized it based on every other piece of evidence, which is called a circumstantial case. Um, and she was she was paid, uh, you know, paid child support, small bit of child support, until I think uh, the mid seventies or something. In the late eighties, early even, I, even after late his 80s. death, in other words, even after his death, it continued. Well, yes, because his death was not acknowledged, right? So I mean, you can't just stop. Hey, Paul's dead, but only you know it. Right. right? So it's okay. So Germany was had 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 mandated based on the circumstantial case that that Paul was the father. Now they wanted, the mother and the daughter wanted to go and get this formalized and it has been attacked on pro so-called Paul McCartney forums uh, and articles for years that somebody must have been after the money or whatever. It turns out that actually um, the intention was not so much a big payment, uh, but the recognition. This is your daughter, you know, that kind of thing. They don't seem to have known that the historical figure from 1942 to now is two people. An historical figure is a symbol, but the reality was two people. So they didn't know that. So they did this court case in the Hamburg, I believe, I forget where, uh, and uh, they, lo they, they lost it because the blood type didn't match. It wasn't DNA, it was blood type. But even so, it eliminated Bettina from being the man who gave the sample or the man from being Bettina's father who uh, who was requesting the sample. Um, they later then did another court case trying to get it reopened as Tina Foster went into, um, and it was shut down for supposedly uh, being over the statute of limitations. But the statute of limitations of being a father never expired. But I think because there was some money involved, like an honorarium or a recognition, it was a small amount, though. It wasn't multi-millions. Um, it was shut down by the German government, and I believe it was because people got involved to actually get it shut down. Shut down. Claire, hold that. Claire, hold we'll that. be right back. This my is Jim Fetzer with my special guest, Claire Coon, and we're Claire. talking about the life and death of Paul McCartney. We'll be right back. Right back. We got about five. We got about five. Okay, and I still okay, see and I still see that. I think we're still on. Okay, and I still see that. 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 Okay,
Revolution Radio, where you, the listeners, are in charge. Here at Revolution Radio, we present 48 broadcast hours of news and information each and every day. Revolution Radio never sleeps. Revolution Radio is worldwide and borderless information. Revolution Radio is also commercial free. Revolution Radio is supported 100% by you, the listeners. And that's why we appeal to you to donate and support this station and its expenses. You can support us in many available options like archive subscriptions, our seed pack selection, or even my woodworking store. And we also even have Revolution Radio swag at the Revolution Radio Zazzle store which you can get t-shirts, coffee cups, even a baby onesie. Or you can just plain donate to the cause. We cannot continue without your support, and your support is what helps pay the bills. So please, if you wish us to continue, please stop by our station support page and drop a dime on us. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Was it a conspiracy? Did you know that the police in Boston were broadcasting This is a Drill, This is a Drill on bullhorns during the marathon? That the Boston Globe was tweeting that a demonstration bomb would be set off during the marathon for the benefit of bomb squad activities? And that one would be set off in one minute in front of the library, which happened as the Globe had announced. Peering through the smoke, you could see bodies with missing arms and legs. But there was no blood. The blood only showed up later and came out of a tube. They used amputee actors and a studio-quality smoke machine. Don't let yourself be played. Check out And Nobody Died in Boston, either. Available at moonrockbooks.com. That's moonrockbooks.com. data safe? Do you have the necessary information to assist you in confidently living through just about any survival situation? Is survival from gardening, off-grid living, medical knowledge, or even natural or man-made EMPs on your list of personal concerns? Do you have your documents and your personal information in a safe place in your hands where you know where it is? Well, check out our preloaded EMP-proof thumb drive. Over 3 gigs of survival documents and how-tos, plus the USDA offline food preservation website, and much, much more, including a surprise bonus we just can't tell you about here. With plenty of room left over to store your most important documents. Imagine if a mega virus or computer failure took out your bank, or all the banks for that matter. Are your banking records safe in your hands so when they get things fixed and repaired, you can say, hey, look, this is what I had. You have it. I want it back. Is your personal data safe? Family records, addresses, phone numbers? Well, squeeze on over to freedomslips.com. Yes, that's www.freedomslips.com. Click the banner on the homepage for the EMP proof bullet drive to get the full scoop of everything that we offer. So, folks, keep your data safe for your peace of mind. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us, we're already here. This is the P. 
people's war. It is our war. We are the fighters. Fight it then. Fight it with all that is in us. And may God defend the right. Warning, warning. We gotta stop us! They're gonna kill us all! See how the trouble you started? Be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, or human beings! Time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious that you're so sick at heart that you can't take part, you can't even passively take part, and you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop, and you've got to win the day to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Revolution Radio of FreedomClips.com, number one, listener supported talk radio station, throwing ourselves upon the gears of the machine. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. You called down the thunder, well now you've got it. Right, you tell them I'm coming, and hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me! Revolution Radio! Even the government admits that 9-11 was a conspiracy. But did you know that it was an inside job that Osama had nothing to do with it? That the Twin Towers were blown apart by a sophisticated arrangement of mini or micro nukes? That Building 7 collapsed seven hours later because of explosives planted in the building? Barry Jennings was there. He heard them go off and felt himself stepping over dead people. The U.S. Geological Survey conducted studies of dust gathered from 35 locations in Lower Manhattan and found elements that would not have been there had this not been a nuclear event. Ironically, that means the government's own evidence contradicts the government's official position. 9-11 was brought to us compliments of the CIA, the neocons, and the Department of Defense, and the Mossad. Don't let yourself be played. Read American Nuked on 9-11. Available at MoonRockBooks.com. That's MoonRockBooks.com. How healthy are your arteries? Deteriorating circulation has a number of early warning signs. High cholesterol, high blood pressure, fingers and or toes often go cold, arms and or legs often go to sleep, sharp diagonal crease in the earlobe, Short walks cause cramping or pains in legs. Memory is not as good as it used to be. Ankles swell late in the day. Chest pain after physical exercise or emotional stress. If you experience even one of these symptoms, your circulatory system is crying out for attention. Extendivite is a natural solution to help improve your overall health. Extendivite is not your average heart tonic. To order, call 1-877-928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com or find us on Amazon. Extend your life with the opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. <laughs> Jim, okay. I'm here now. Hi. Now, Michigan, Hi. Michigan State is ahead by two points with nine seconds to go over Duke, and it's going to be a huge upset if it happens, but Duke's got the ball. So, oh, good. Okay. With those few seconds to go, I was hoping to see the end of the game, but, of course, the, the time clock is not changeable. So, Claire, you're doing a great job with all of this. I love it. Uh, well, I'd like to just finish regarding Bettina and Stephen and the idea of DNA tests, plus one other point that comes up about Stephen's um, testimony. Okay, so the, the, the point about Stephen's testimony besides his birth uh, period, uh, the, the gestation and 
pregnancy period. Um, and the issue of, um, uh, you know, who was his mother and the idea of uh, would, would the Beatles have come to visit at all. Um, the other issue is uh, John Lennon, as Tina rightly pointed out and I pointed out in the interview itself uh, with Stephen and you, is that John Lennon officially was not likely to leave the USA in the, in the period, at, at that period, because he to get to England, to make this vi visit and other things that he might have done. So could he have been in England? And she, of course, was saying that's highly unlikely. Uh, what I would say is this. If Stephen is right, it happened. Uh, and therefore, how would it have happened? I'm not claiming it did. I'm saying how could it have? It turns out there is a way. And I went over it in the broadcast with you and Stephen. The way is this. John Lennon had been trying to get a green card, or if you will, kind of a a, 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 a status in the USA so that he could live and travel and be kind of like a USA citizen. Um, and he was living in New York with Yoko Ono at the time in 1975. Um, but right at that point, it already was through, we now know through secret channels, the word was going out to the lawyer of John Lennon that he would get the green card. It was kind of going to be on its way there. Nixon and the rest of them had tried to save face. I mean, Nixon was out by then, but the people around him or, you know, in the next administration. So, so they were going to give John his green card. That's number one. So in behind the scenes, it might have been approved for a very important purpose. The second thing is, when we're dealing with spycraft, uh, what some people call deep state operations, that kind of thing, depending on who's approving it, things can be made to happen. And we have plenty of official examples of that as well as, in our cases, unofficial examples. So it's very possible that MI5, who's been law and six, from the UK, who have been long embedded with the CIA and back and forth, especially since World War II, um, that they shared information that they made this happen. Why? It wouldn't be for John Lennon to go, if it happened, it wouldn't be for John Lennon to go visit Irene. It would be for another purpose. So then we have to think what was going on in April 1975 for the Beatles. Turns out that from 1970, 71 to 70. Late 74, early 75, there was a, there were a huge set of court cases to settle the Beatles' um, assets, and I think a large sticking point was the fact that Bill, the replacement, was in that. And it had to be worked out legally, although it's illegal, it's an impersonation, but worked out as legally as possible for all of the... Um, for all of the um, all of the people involved, and the money had been approved, it had been settled and signed and everything by January 1975. Claire, hold but that thought. I just want to give a news flash. Duke was fouled coming in. They had two free throws. Their shooter missed the first free throw. Michigan State upset Duke by one point. Okay, congratulations. Oh yeah. dear. Well, there were the. They were the Big Ten rep that was left in the conference, so we were very pleased about that. My own team, Wisconsin, got knocked off in the first round. But, Scar, you're doing oh. a great job with all of this. Carry on. Well, I mean, I've had time to think it through and know it very intensely. So, anyway, the point is that John could have made that trip, I mean, if you understand the behind-the-scenes stuff. And, and also, given where his green card was actually at, but unofficially, Again, there could have been channels in the U.S. that would have let him go. So in January 1975, the Beatles' stuff had been settled legally. Oh, now, of course, I consider it illegal when you have a replacement after death of a famous person. However, the legal minutiae had been settled for the parties involved. Okay, so but the money wouldn't be available till April. So in fact, George Harrison was in the U.K., uh, Ringo was in the UK, and on the 4th of April, uh, uh, Bill, the replacement, Saul, Saul's Paul, Bill, or Sir Paul McCartney in his fake name, his corporate fiction, had gotten back to the UK. John was the only sticking point. If they had had to come back to the UK to do some final legal things or whatever, John might have been brought back to the UK at that point. And by the 21st of April, Irene is dead. Okay? So uh, Stephen said that 
he, he, he was interrupted by the Beatles, including Sir Paul Bill and his mother, who was along for moral support, I guess, um, probably to come visit his mother. Uh, he was out playing marbles. He saw them coming up the empty street, and he started to talk to them. And all he remembered was that a week later, he was told his mother had lung cancer, and she wasn't sick. And a week after that, his mother died. Well, that is exactly true, because from the 4th of April to the 21st is, you know, just over th like two and a half weeks or so. It, it's so right there at the beginning of April, maybe 4th to 10th, this visit could have happened. And Tina didn't realize that because she's not out there studying my materials. I mean, I study hers. I study everybody's. I, she's got a more superficial version of this particular issue. So the point about Stephen is it is entirely possible. Now, um, Stephen and Bettina is another issue. We know of Philip uh, Cochran, who was in Liverpool. He seems to be a Paul child. We know of Bettina in Germany. She's recognized as Paul child. We know some others, possibly, and then there's Stephen. So again, yes, if you could do DNA testing, obviously DNA testing is something you can add to the mix. But the problem is, it's extremely dangerous for the people involved. Anyone in these cases who thinks that spies don't come visit, or lawyers don't come and tell them something, or somebody isn't bought off, is really, really ignorant. It doesn't mean, of course, you should just posit that all the time in life. But in these cases, yes. Now, um, I also see, saw a question regarding John Lennon from the chat. Can you repeat it to me so that yeah, I can Yeah, the question it? is, how many Beatles remain alive? Was John Lennon's death suspicious? Uh, one Beatle remains alive. I do not consider Bill a Beatle. But, but if we technically speaking say he was, because he was brought in through some kind of spy craft, then okay, two Beatles remain alive. And yes, John's uh, death was immensely more than suspicious. Fenton Bressler, the lawyer, did the initial work demolishing the idea that Chapman could have or would have done it. Um, and there's far more evidence now about John's death, which I went yeah. into with you on a radio broadcast yeah. uh, years ago. And I wish it were still up. But I can, I can run over that very quickly. Um, uh, Chapman originally said he didn't remember shooting at all. Uh, there was another man, there were two other men present. One was the armed front guard and the other, there was also an interior guard, but I mean one who would have witnessed it. Uh, an armed front guard, and another man who was never named. The man who was never named was Scruffy, and was only identified as an elevator guy, repairman or a repairman. He was the first suspect of the police, until the other man who was present turned to Chapman and said, this bookish guy over here who's reading a book, he's the one who did it. And the police didn't believe it, but they, they arrested this strange young man and took him in. Um, also, the, the shots were coming from actually the wrong direction for Chapman. However, uh, all of that evidence was um, uh, sort of dropped because Chapman rescinded and claimed he was guilty. And he was contacted by many people in prison, so he could well have been influenced to say that. He also seems to have been under a mind control. Now, you and I know that mind control is also propaganda. You can call it propaganda, mind control, but I mean direct, psychiatric, strange, hypnotic mind control that seems to have been involved in Chapman's life. He also had too much money to be doing certain things that he was doing, and, and yet he, and he hated guns, but he loved guns in certain moments. It was a whole thing about Chapman. He was in various places where the CIA was running covert activities through charities so that they could be in places running guns and doing interference in various countries. He seems to show up in several of those countries at those times. So Chapman is an interesting um, seeming mind control victim. So who were the other two men? One was this elevator guy who could have uh, hidden in an alcove. Uh, further down in the in the barrel vault, and he would have been at the wrong angle to shoot John from the back.
but he could have walked past John to the front and turned around and shot with execution style. The doctor said that it was execution style. It was all around the heart region. Um, the body was uh, destroyed right after through Yoko Ono. Um, uh, uh, the, the, she has never had the autopsy report um, given, but someone who saw the autopsy report said there were five shots and one had missed and blah, blah, blah. That's more than Chapman's gun could contain. And then you have this armed guard, and the armed guard, who was the only other official person present, uh, he was named Yo Jose Perdomo, and we don't have his name for another seven years. Finally, it shows up in People magazine, and he supposedly was talking about the Bay of Pigs and Castro and Kennedy's assassination with Chapman right before the killing. And Jose Perdomo, of the same description and of the same interests, was also the head of Operation 40 assassination into Castro Cuban team and later became um, the, the head of uh, on the ground operations. But he was officially dead, according to the CIA at that time. But his family didn't know of his death until after. So it was probably a fake death. He was probably on the Lennon scene. He was probably the overseer. But the unnamed man was probably the assassin. And no. there was a researcher who has now sort of disappeared. Um, and he traced a lot of stuff about the Kennedy assassination and the, and the, and the Lennon death. And he tried to get the records from the NYPD. They said, uh, we refuse you the records of the police notes, but, we, but they officially said they do not have the photographs of the crime scene. So for John Lennon's crime scene, there are no photos available, which is a very strange thing. But very few people ask. They assume it's Chapman. So I think it was an ambush. I think it was an MI5-6 and CIA ambush. There were also piece, uh, about four people in a cab who drove up and witnessed it, and they were never traced by the police. Um, there was a limo driver, possibly, and there were ear witnesses, and these two men, and Yoko Ono. That's it. Those are the only people present. Why, uh, do, you so think, uh, John, why do you think John was taken out? Well, I think it's really obvious why John was taken out. I mean, he was not anti-government, but he was anti-bad government. Uh, he was a figurehead for all kinds of people who wanted to continue real awareness and agitation against, let's say, um, uh, union wreckers and um, uh, people's rights wreckers and economic wreckers and war world wreckers. And uh, George Bush Sr. was coming in on the tick under the ticket. Uh, of uh, 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 Ronald Reagan, he forced himself sort of on, I mean, sort of forced himself onto the ticket with Reagan, and just after that, Reagan was um, almost killed, and it was not by um, the, the 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 man Hinckley, uh, who was reading the same book as Chapman. Um, Hinckley Jr. knew George Bush Sr. Uh, his brother was a good friend of George Bush Sr. But what actually seems to have almost killed um, Reagan was a flechette, a tiny little disc, because the doctor at the hospital couldn't find where the bullet wound was, and a nurse noticed a teeny little cut, and when they went down there, they found a little disc, and this was a kind of a secret weapon thing of the CIA at the time. A lot of these things had just come out in the, in the Senate uh, assassination and mind control intelligence hearings, 1966 to 70, 68, uh, sorry, 77, 78. Um, so John Judge, uh, who was, who also died recently, um, uh, he, he exposed this, uh, the Reagan assassination for what it was. So, Lennon was just before that to bring in a, you could call it a right wing. I mean, I'm not against conservatism, but let's say the people who are rabidly pro corporate, rabidly pro war, often that's seen as conservative. Um, the liberals have now been dumbed down, so they also are pro war if they're propaganda is the right way. But in general, you know, it was the conservatives at the time who were the CIA and the MI5 types. Right. So, uh, yeah, I think it's really obvious why John was taken out. However, I think it's also for PID. I think John was probably about to talk. Uh, and later, George Harrison in 1999 was attacked in his home in a huge 
uh, it's usually misrepresented as his London home. It was actually a huge estate with broken glass on the upside. He had uh, security cameras and all that stuff. And it's a mansion. I mean, he bought this ancient mansion. And in comes this guy through the front door who was obviously crazy or manic or drawn up and who had claimed that he had been told to kill people. He'd been involved in a Christian cult, but he was talking about devil worship. So he probably was in this culty death stuff. And he was probably a mind control victim himself. And he just wouldn't let go. He had a seven-inch knife. He, he stabbed George over 40 times, which was covered up at first and later acknowledged. George survived it and then died of cancer, metastasized cancer, which was claimed to be uh, like a throat cancer. But actually, it was like um, all of the, um, you know, he is he was over healing, like he healed up and kept healing, which means those cells are not, not being taken away. And he ultimately died of a cancer from trying to heal the, these attack wounds. He nearly died. Um, and his brother at age 66, um, died of cancer. You know, that cancer can be induced, you know, about Dr. Mary's monkey, the book in New Orleans. So his brother died at age 66. 66, which is, of course, the year that Paul died in 66. And um, he was working with the other George Harrison brother on the estate. He would have known what the actual security measures were, and he probably wanted to talk. So, I mean, PID and big um, power uh, aspects, including cults, some in Freemasonry or Satanic cults, some, some in regular religious churches are dealing drugs or involved with uh, gun operations or slave rings. So what, what we have is this stuff is linked, but I think that John was taken out. Oh, I hate the term taken out, killed, uh, because of mostly the political regular reasons, but, um, but also possibly the PID reasons. Because it had, uh, it had gotten, you know, it was what, 10 years, oh no, 10 or 13 years, it was 13 years to the day of the Magical Mystery Tour album coming out in the UK. So again, 13, witchy, culty, and Paul McCartney's name. Four letters, nine letters, 13. I mostly agree with what you've been describing here. Oli and I have talked about the shooter yeah. having been this uh, op. 40 guy. Is it Perdomo or Padilla? I get both names. As far Jose, as the, the flesh. Jose, Jose Perdomo is the name given in People magazine. The man who was in Operation 40 and known historically was Jose Sanjenis Perdomo. But I don't think that Ole Demogard really has processed that other person who was unnamed, scruffy, the suspect, and present. And so I know that you can say Jose Perdomo did it. It's a good enough explanation. But I think the actual shooter who was being overseen by Jose Perdomo was this other man. But that's, I mean, again, you know, it's and sort of the same idea. Certainly John Hinckley didn't shoot Ronald Reagan, although he did shoot his his press secretary. My impression has been it was a Secret Service agent when he pushed Reagan into the car, shot him actually under the armpit, but it was a small flechette as you described. Yes, and the idea exactly. was to get the message to Ronnie, let George do it. Well, actually, it nearly, it did nearly kill him. Um, I think that the plan was to do it, but there was a meeting in the hospital with um, Ronald Reagan's um, right-hand guys uh, and one of them came out shaking, and uh, and basically after that, uh, I think he was allowed to live. I think that there was a deal cut. Uh, it's sort of like, well, you survived, okay. And they actually tried to take him to a different hospital, as was done with Diana. Um, but they did end up getting it to a hospital that was more loyal. And that probably saved his life, although they didn't at first see the flechette. So again, I mean, these are cases that uh, you know usually don't go into. So let's just say, let's say they're all wrong. Paul is still dead. 
So we can go back to that. <laughs> no, Claire, no, Claire. I've been enjoying this. Look, uh, Sirhan Sirhan's a perfect example of a mind control candidate. In fact, there was a, a, a psychiatrist associated with the CIA who explained he actually went on radio and boasted how he'd hypnotized Sirhan for the CIA. He appears to have been triggered off by the girl in the polka dot dress, but he was only the patsy. He updated his his Smith and Wesson uh, eight shots, uh, but there was many as 15 fired in the pantry, and Bobby was hit from the side, and uh, as he fell, the shooter continued to fire. He had a similar type of weapon. It appears to have been uh, Thane Eugene Caesar. He was actually holding Bobby by the left arm and shot him behind the right ear from about an inch and a half, and then Bobby fell, and he continued firing, and he shot twice underneath the armpit, one of which nearly lodged in his spine, the fourth of which went through his jacket but didn't hit Bobby himself. And, you know, he it's all very terrible because he, Bobby and Jack were two of my great political heroes. Well, yes, and, and John Lennon was too. You know, people would treat him as a, as a washed-up singer or some kind of rabid commie or whatever. They don't actually understand. I mean, the man was trying to help people. He also was under an extreme psychological dis distress from knowing that his friend had died and now he's in a big international conspiracy. He did not set out to become a conspiracy theorist about the secret ops. He what? set out to be a, you know, more of a peace person. And that was true even back when Paul was alive. Now, regarding, um, uh, what was it, you know, Sir Han, of course, the main, the main case is that um, Noguchi, who was the LAPD famous coroner at the time, was the one that found powder burns in the head wound, knowing that that was a very close, uh, within an inch or an inch and a half of the head that the shot had been made, and he was forced to quit and move and shut up. Yeah, um, incredible. Then, this guy was world famous. And he yes, had a brilliant yes. autopsy on Bobby. I mean, all that we're talking about comes from Noguchi's perfectly successful autopsy. But because his, his report was at odds with the police, it reflects the power of the L.A. Police Department at the time that when there was the conflict, the police overrode the coroner when it ought to be precisely the opposite way around. Well, I, I yes, and this, this raises an issue of um, how could this stuff be covered up. Um, in fact, it's not really. But it's covered up enough that if you don't want to know it, it's, it's not not true or there's no evidence because it, 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 there's, as you've talked about disinformation isn't always all, all of it's wrong it's enough wrong or casting doubt of ever knowing uh, and um, the same is true also of Paul's death Paul's death is unique people who like to treat it as maybe all the Beatles died or um, you know, I see a different photo, so it's a different person, or um, they don't understand lens distortion, so anytime your your eyes look wide, oh, it's a new person, or, um, you know, they tend, uh, there are some people now who, because they know these kinds of other cases in the big background, and they use the term Illuminati, and they use the term, you know, satanic uh, takeover, or it, it's sort of, that's sort of generally accurate, but... If you do that to an individual case, you lose the specifics of the case. And Paul was unique. The, the, the factors that went into the Paul death, if he was murdered, um, come from other places. Obviously, the ability to use disguises, the ability to have, as you say, coroners who are on side with or overridden by others, um, and, and various secret society affiliations and all that stuff. But, but in Paul's case, it was a public figure replacement it, it, right in the face of everybody. And the family would have had to have known, but thought it might be temporary or, you know, been paid off but scared. The other, the friends wouldn't have wanted to be involved, but it would become, well, you know, it's better for everybody and his legacy gets to continue. There are people who question why. You wouldn't just put in a new Beatle. You don't understand the Beatles in 1966 then because the Beatles were awesome. And they had been awesome for many years. And though they had troubles by 66, they were still Beatlemania. And we cannot forget that. So when this occurred, it killed Beatlemania. It killed Beatlemania. The, the subsequent albums made more money, but that's because 
they were really riding on the coattails of the love, the affection, the interactivity, and the amazingness um, of the Beatles. And I'm calling the Beatles, I mean, with Paul. They were going in new directions. Um, Paul and George and John and Ringo were moving into a kind of more mature format. Um, they were experimenting a bit in the studio, uh, but they were still loving performers. They, w they were performers. They got tired by the end of 60 seconds. They were not planning to quit. They were planning, they were feeling like quitting because it was so overwhelming. Uh, but they were not planning to permanently quit. Paul dies. Well, what do you do? You can't say about the Beatles, we're going to have a new member. It would have been the end. Anyone who doesn't understand that really doesn't understand how awesome the Beatles were. They've been suckered by the second half of the Beatles and all the other bands that benefited from the, the basically the breakup of the Beatles in 1966. It was a breakup. It fractured everything. And then there was the necessity of invention, keeping going. Uh, for example, Klaus Fuhrman, 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 he's a German, uh, who knew the Beatles in Hamburg and did the design of the revolver cover and was friends with uh, Stuart Sutcliffe's um, girlfriend. He was an early Beatle member, um, and he died. Uh, and, and Klaus Foreman had said in an interview with, I think, AETV, um, John was absolutely broken. He was sad during the Sgt. Pepper uh, recordings. Um, I couldn't cheer him up. He was pulling off, uh, you know, bush, bush leaves. And I said, but John, you know, the poor bush can't help it. You'll have to let it go. What was he letting go? Paul's death. There is nothing else that accounts for everything in the historical and physical record. So, yes, I mean, you know, um, people who say there were multiple Pauls or multiple Beatles, they don't understand the photographic record. I know Tina is wonderful about Paul, but uh, she says, like, John didn't have this nose, and he didn't, you know, she thinks he was replaced, you know, or he, he, did, he certainly did. You can find pictures of John with exactly the same bone structure and nose structure, just thinned out, thinned out as the later John Lennon. Had. Which you can't find with James Paul McCartney and Billy Shears. No, there is. There are one or two. There are one or two really good fake photos where there's a body of Bill and a younger face of Paul. Okay, I will. I will say that there are there are a couple that are really well done, and then there is Bill with a lens distortion on his face. Famous. Um, there are two places it's famous. It's the, in, the inside cover of um, a Sgt. Pepper album, which is a composite image, and it's, it's got black. It's like really strange. It creates a totally different jawline and a weird rounded face. Um, and also for uh, the Let It, was it Let It? No, the White Album, there were four posters. And the one of the supposed Paul McCartney is close up cropped, which always makes you look younger, and rounded, very rounded. So the problem is that Paul didn't have a, like, a moon round face. What he had was his own face, and he was younger, and he looked more, I mean, he had something, in certain angles, he was very beautiful, cute, and young looking, but in other angles, a little less so. Um, and but, so, but he had a boyishness, you know, he, had, he had a boyishness about him, Claire, that was almost unmistakable. I mean, it was really yes, charming. I mean, they always like they always referred to Paul as the cute one. Uh, uh, yes, well, he was cute, but of course, he was more than cute. There was something a little exotic about him. And something also collapsed into a fit of giggles, but he also could be very serious. People, a lot of people don't know Paul, so let's talk about Paul's character. I've been misrepresented, particularly by Mike Williams, as suggesting, along with Tina, that Paul is perfect and wonderful, and he's just an angel. No, but he's angelic. Angelic means that he's a fun-loving, real loving person who also can be a real... Uh, Hellraiser. Hellraiser. You know, a real S or, you know. Um, and so, but he was not a mean, you know, a, a driven or neurotically distant person. So the way that Bill has to be explained psychologically by most people is 
well, Paul took drugs and he just changed, you know. No, no. because what happens when you take drugs is, first of all, your whole body does not shift. But uh, you can you can look really different superficially, the way that John looks and it confused Tina. But it's not going to be a a total, um, you know, a, a bone structure shift and, and height shift and total mannerisms. Um, John was still funny. He was raucous, but he was angry and sad and depressed. He probably, if he hadn't actually gotten shot, and if he continued down the road he was, he probably would have died of stomach troubles, anxiety, and anorexia and bulimia. He was very ill, as well as doing heroin, which was denied at the time. Okay, so this affects you, but he still was. You know, cute, fun, sassy, and sardonic, and brilliant. And his music is deep and incisive when it's good. Bill, it's, um, you know, trilling and um, superficial or nasty. Like, like Helter Skelter is a, it's a song of, you know, a style. But it also, he was intending to make it gritty. He seems to have been connected to the worst elements of the... CIA like MI5, uh, if you want to call it Crowley, um, occultism, um, you could call it satanic, um, but you could also call it, um, you know, just a basic CIA culty crap. Um, and I'm not saying all occultism is bad. What I'm saying is the occult that becomes a, a justification for bad acts oh. is bad. Now, there are questions coming in about supposedly Paul's one-legged woman, psychologically. That isn't Paul. You have to start calling him Bill or Sir Paul, at least while you're learning about the case. Um, I think that uh, Heather Mills may yeah. have possibly been attacked um, by that um, car incident that she lost her leg in. She was the second wife of Sir Paul, but that is not Paul McCartney. Um, whether she did or didn't, um, Sir Paul possibly was abusive, um, and he may have sought to... You're, um, you're talking about you know, after the death of Linda Eastman, whom he loved. You know, there's this wonderful story about how they met, where Linda, of course, she'd been photog photographing all the bands, and she knew the Beatles very well. And the, when they met, she said, "I know. When did you? I know you're not Paul. When did you join the band?" And they just went on for there. I mean, there was no pretense. And of course, they lived together on the farm and all that. Where Life magazine came out to do the photo shoot to try to prove that Paul was really alive. It was all quite a PR stunt, and it, it didn't amount to anything for those who understood the story. But she seems to have put together. a a box of evidence, and that is when she pieced together Heather the Mills truth. Did, yes, Heather Mills, not Linda. Yes. Right, Heather. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Linda loved uh, loved uh, Bill. I mean, that, that that was so wonderful. You know, I mean, he, he wasn't uh, infatuated with Jane Asher. Or he really cared about Linda Eastman, and uh, they did wonderful stuff with Wings, for example. What one of those songs is one of my wife's favorite. You know, about the. the Keep your feet up off the ground. There are little cats around and all that. I mean, it's great stuff. Now, the other question here is about the spoon woman, Claire. i got to confess, I don't know this story here. Do you know anything about a spoon woman who allegedly uh, uh, beat the Beatles at the clubs in Liverpool? Does that make any sense at all? No, I don't know that, but I, I can talk on something else that that question made me think of. Go. Oh. Um, uh, I don't know what they're getting at there, uh, but but this issue of one-leggedness, um, I brought it up in, in an interview with Mike Williams um, uh, in November, in September, which he posted in November, uh, and the view count went up to 7.5 thousand twice and went back down to 200 again, so they're messing with the views for that one. But anyway, um, uh, what, what happened was um, there was a spoof movie done in the 70s called The Ruttles, as though you're rutting, you're so sexual, like the Beatles, but the Ruttles, because the Beatles, of course, were very um, able to, and, and, and were symbols, uh, the kind of sex symbols, though they were not 
playing up their sexiness. It wasn't like they were being really sexy, but they were being really appealing, uh, and that was very sexy, and they had a lot of sex. So this this movie came out, The Ruttles, and it involved Neil Innes uh -huh. and um, Eric Idle, who, of course, Eric Idle was uh, in the, in the um, uh, Monty Python band and was a good friend of George Harrison. And Neil Innes, who was the, the brains behind this, um, one of the brains behind this uh, um, movie and these shows, um, he had actually founded back in the early 60s a, a band called the Bonzo Dog Do That Band uh, with a man named Vivian Stanshaw. And they knew the Beatles. And when Paul died, Vivian Stanshaw played uh, a wild singer who is um, uh, talking about, this is one of the ideas that there was a woman present, but it's presented as a prostitute or someone who leads Paul to his death in a cab. Um, Neil Innes and Vivian Stanshall had written Death Cab for Cutie before that. So it's obviously a P.I.D. song, Paul is Dead song, that was used in 1967 for the Magical Mystery Tour film. And in very good quality print, no, uh, Vivian Stanchel's not wearing latex. No, it's not Bill Paul playing Vivian Stanchel. And no, Bill Paul is not Vivian. Okay, Vivian was a real person. And Neil Innes oh. and, um, and, and Vivian Stanchel got involved later. Well, uh, uh, Vivian didn't, but uh, Neil and Eric Idle got involved in the Ruddles. Now, in the Ruddles, in the spoof in the 1970s, uh, it has wonderful music, but one of the things that goes on in it is there's a character which is supposed to be their manager or influencer. And if we think of all these conspiracy cases you and I know of, you can say there's this big background knowledge or background groups that some, you know, sometimes some of them are involved in these cases. Um, one of the elements in the Beatles case uh, that probably was influencing their early career, at least to help them once they were known and going to be good for the realm, was the Royals. The Royals did see Paul McCartney play at, Ro at, Royal, at, um, at Royal Albert Hall, um, and they, they saw the Beatles. And in the Ruddles in 1975, there's a character called Leggy Mountbatten. And Lady Mountbatten, of course, refers to, uh, for various reasons, Louis Mountbatten, who was the uncle of the uh, of the the current um, uh, prince consort or king. It's not a king, but uh, with Elizabeth II, and was very influential in the British throne. He's a German royal, and he was the viceroy of India, who helped arrange that Gandhi and the rest of them got India back from the British. Claire, I've got the spoon story. Here it is. On the okay, can I teach about Leggy? So Leggy, Leggy is the name for this this Epstein character who's gay and he's Jewish and so on. So it's obviously their manager, but they also say Leg his name is Leggy Mountbatten. And in my previous interview, I said it was because, as the website says, um, uh, Brian Epstein was interested in, in in men. So it's the leg. But think about this: if others were giving a leg up. To the Beatles, you could represent that as Leggy Mountbatten or the managerial element was missing their leg. And it also allows you to play on the name Louis Mountbatten. It's like, you know, give a leg up, you got my leg, it's gone. It's very funny. But it doesn't mean that the Freemasons and the Tavistock Institute and all of these kinds of organizations ran the Beatles totally controlled them. There were corporate wheels, there was, you know, hopes and influences. The Beatles were not a set of revolving door doubles. This is totally untenable. They were not simply written by other people and it was a total project from the beginning. But were there people who benefited or gave a leg up or helped them out? Yes. And after Paul died, they kind of did end up playing for the purpose of the cover-up, and it must have nearly killed John, and ultimately it physically killed John through assassination. So you were going to talk about the spoon. Yeah, point. I found the story here. I had misunderstood. Here, Here's the report. On the Graham Norton Show, a popular British cable TV talk show on the BBC, Graham asked guest Paul McCartney if the Beatles have ever, had ever participated in a local talent show before they became famous. They had. Graham asked them if they had won. No. 
Paul McCartney explained, there was this old woman who played the spoons, and she always beat us. It sounds ludicrous that the band, considered by many as the greatest and most influential of the rock era, lost out to a woman who played the musical spoons, but it's true. A lesser band might have given up, but the Beatles continue as a group from 1960 to 1970 and eventually had sales of over a billion units, as estimated by EMI. Well, well let's, let's talk about that, because when we read things of supposedly Paul McCartney saying various things, if it's Bill, he's often lying. Okay, he's often lying, and lately he's been doing a lot of it. I remember when... It's not true. Suddenly he has all these memories, and a lot of them are inaccurate. And Tina does go through some of the inaccuracies that have cropped up. So this could have been a made-up so, story by Bill? Yeah, I think it could have. Oh, no, you know, we, we, we were beaten by a woman with spoons. It sounds like something really that he'd make up. Now, if it was Paul, he, he was a joker. I mean, Paul would joke like John, and they, but they were one-off jokes. Bill really likes to screw with the history. And in fact, his biographer, Philip Norman, I think his name was, said, you should go and ask the questions to Ringo. But Paul McCartney, he likes to rewrite history. Now, that means Philip Norman knows. You see what I'm saying? Like, there's lots of people that know this stuff. Are they going to come out? No, they'd be isolated. They'd be immediately laughed at. And they'd probably be threatened or dead. Okay, it, it, it's just not going to happen, but they do say things. So yeah, when you read Paul McCartney this, Paul McCartney that, a lot of it is Bill, and, and a lot of it is inaccurate. Uh, so, you know, I don't and, have and any just, And just for the record, Claire, although I've implied it, you mean that his replacement was indeed William Shepard, known colloquially as Billy Shears, who's introduced on the Sgt. Pepper album. With a new Sergeant Pepper's not, Lonely Hearts Go Band. Shepherd or Shears. It cannot be Shepherd or Shears. It well, cannot be Shepherd or Shears. Those are cover names. Okay, so what we have is Shears is Billy's here. Billy Shears. Billy Shears. Okay. No, Billy I, take Shears. It, I took it Billy, Billy Shears was a nickname for William Shepherd because a shepherd sheep Shears sheep. Yes. Yes, but that, that is wrong? already an assumption. The name Shears was in the movie, um, uh, I think it was um, uh, Colonel Halsey, in which there was a replacement, okay, of a, of a man. And, and Bill, uh, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Bill, uh, Billy Shears was his name or something. So there's, they're playing on any kind of replacement reference. What is his name? Why, why did they careful. introduce him? Why did they introduce him as the one and only Billy Shears? See, you look at the cover album, Claire, of the Sergeant Pepper, and it's very obvious it's a, a burial. You've got a left-handed guitar. You got the Madame Tussauds original Beatles in wax and black. Then you got the resplendent new band. Paul is noticeably taller than he's ever been before. And they introduced the band, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and the one and only Billy Shears. That seems to me an overt declaration that Paul is dead and has been replaced by Billy it Shears. Is. But they're not going to give you his name there. Well, I don't know, you know why not. You, you know, I, I have the parts I've read of the memoirs of Billy Shears seem to me very convincing. You, you think that's a work of fiction? Okay, okay, if you're going to take the, okay, so that's good, that brings us to the memoirs book. Okay, first of all, the man's name is Campbell, okay, he said it himself in a backwards clue in 2007 on memory almost fully, says, who is this now, who is this now, who is this now, I was Willie Campbell, I was Willie Campbell. Now, that is so clear and Fred Labour, the man in the late 1969, who, as I said, he put stuff together and he made up a story and he did the whole thing. He also said it was William Campbell. When he was questioned on that, he said, oh, oh, I just made that up. It could have been like, I don't know, you know. But that's a natural name. That's a real type name. Shears and Shepherd aren't as com well, Shepherd is common. But anyway, the other thing that, that happens with Campbell is you notice that Bill Campbell, which is his real name, often wears the Campbell tartan. His wife, Linda, designed a McCartney and Campbell tartan mix. 
He presents himself as a Campbell. He lives in Campbelltown, Scotland. Right. The, 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 the farm that was bought before, before Paul bought the farm in the sense of died, that's an expression, um, Paul bought a farm for, uh, for uh, tax purposes that um, uh, Jane Asher recommended way up in, in Campbelltown, Scotland, and in comes this Bill Campbell later. So there's also evidence of possible premeditation there. I should mention why people think it's a murder. Um, I've mentioned various forms of evidence towards the murder, physical evidence, logical, historical evidence, but there's also that Mark Lane, who recently died four days from Tony Barrow, who also talked about PID in his book, talked about Paul is dead in his book, um, so they may have been murdered. But anyway, um, Mark Lane, who did so much awesome work and did plausible denial and, of course, originally um, rushed to judgment about the JFK case in 1966, uh, his book came out in August 66. In the previous December 1965, he was in London and he was peddling the book manuscript. Paul McCartney, yes, the original Paul, um, the real person, he got a copy of that. He read it, he called up Mark Lane, and Mark Lane said, who are you, I don't recognize you, you know, I don't follow these things, and he says, I'm Paul McCartney of the Beatles, I read your book, your manuscript, so Oswald couldn't have done it, could he? And they had a two or three hour conversation, they stayed in touch for six or seven months, when Mark Lane published the book the next summer, he, oh, just before that he was back in London, and he heard Eleanor Rigby by John and Paul before they recorded it, he writes about this in his, um, in his uh, autobiography, Citizen Lane. And right after Paul reads that book and he's talking to Mark Lane, he has what's called a moped accident. And in that so-called moped accident, he has injuries that do not match a moped accident, but they do match being beaten up. Okay, and so in December 1965, Paul was probably beaten up with his friend who was a socialite and a high-end guy, uh, Tara Brown, who died the next year. Um, uh, they were probably beaten up, and Sir Paul claims that it was the full moon distracting him. It was actually the dark of the moon that night, so per Sir Paul is creating another disinformational thing. And in the anthology stuff of the Beatles, in the book of the anthology of the Beatles from the, from the 1990s, um, the, the moped accident date is put at Paul's death date. So there's all kinds of attempts to overlap this stuff. But Paul may have been killed as an absolute have to die because of his involvement with Mark Lane and the Kennedy issue. He was going to write the film score to Mark Lane's movie, which was copyrighted in 1966, but came out in 67. It's available. You can watch it. It's called, um, people can watch it. It's called the same as his book, right? Uh, Let me just say uh, before we have to part, uh, and you've done a wonderful job, Claire. If you do a search on William Campbell, comma, Billy Shears, you get a whole lot of images for William Campbell Shears. So there yes. may be a merge here. It's very interesting. Lots of photographs that I have not seen before, and I've been interested in this for a very long time. I can't thank you enough, Claire. Where can people find your work online? Well, I run a Facebook group that's a high-end study group of this issue. I also have You Can Know Sometimes, Y-O-U-C-A-N-K-N-O-W, sometimes, dot blogspot dot com lots of information there um, and I should also I guess I mean I don't make money for this but I should plug Tina's book which is great um, and uh, maybe maybe in the last minute you guys could run the slides I sent it would no, be no we don't we don't have time Claire and this okay time. well people can also go to my Mike Williams my Mike Williams oops Claire oh. I think we may be already Claire, gone, maybe yeah. already gone. <laughs> Okay, that's cool. Thanks so much. You did a great job. Thanks, everyone, okay, for listening. Thanks to Claire Kuhn for being here. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for all of you for listening. Thank you so much. And, Jim, you know, there's all kinds Claire, of people propose things. It doesn't mean Claire, they're all true. I Claire, love we're you. Still, we're still live. I know. You, <laughs> you, you, uh, you, okay. people propose you did, you, things. You did, a great, you did a great job. Check out that uh, 
wonderful page of Billy Shears and uh, William Campbell. Very good, very good. Well done, Claire. Well done. Thank you, Jim. Have we'll a good you. night. Thanks. You too. Bye. <laughs> That was Claire Kuhn on uh, Paul is Dead. I think between he her and uh, Tina, maybe we'll have Nick Kohlerstrom at some time along the way. They're pretty much covered all the bases. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I. Thank you all for listening.